the big picture, clarity, compassion, and love in action. I'm Michael Dowd, and I'm recording this in February of 2021. There are four parts to this program, and I encourage you to actually stop at the end of each one and take a break because this is information dense. And if you're not already familiar with this material, it's going to be challenging. First section, sustainable versus unsustainable. Why progress breeds ecocide and denial. Abrupt climate collapse, what is inevitable, what's futile, and what does it mean to be enlightened now? Sobering inspiration, honoring who, what, and where we really are. And now what? Living meaningfully and courageously at Tiatawaki, that is, the end of the world as we know it. I'm a sacred realist. I'm an evidential mystic, meaning evidence helps me become more intimate with reality. I'm a religious naturalist. Here's my eco-theo credo. Reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And fostering fidelity to the future is my mission. I suggest that sustainable means faithful to the future. Unsustainable means unfaithful to the future. And everything else is but a footnote or a distraction. And honoring limits is the only way to be faithful to the future. The delusion of limitlessness is inherently ecocidal. So I want to start by demythologizing faith. Your God is whatever you put your faith or trust in. In other words, your ultimate concern. And this isn't just Michael Dowd saying this, arguably the most influential Protestant theologian of the 20th century. Paul Tillich famously identified faith as your ultimate concern. So if technology or progress is where you put your faith, that's your God. Paul Chaferka is one of my most cherished colleagues. He has five stages of awakening, climbing the ladder of awareness. Dead asleep, awareness of one fundamental problem, awareness of many problems, awareness of the interconnections between the many problems, and awareness that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. This maps my experience exactly. From the mid 1980s until 2000, I had an ecological understanding of reality. And then in 2000, I read several books that put me on a techno-optimist, sort of unidirectional, human-centered understanding of reality. And really, I was in denial from 2000 to 2012. And then on December 3rd of 2012, I watched David Roberts' TEDx talk, Climate Change is Simple, the remix, which was added music. And it changed my life. And then in 2013, I became aware of many problems. 2014, I became aware of the interconnections between the many problems. And then in January of 2015, I read William Catton's masterful book, Overshoot, the most important book I've ever read in my life. And I became aware that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. In fact, Paul Chaferka also says that Overshoot by William Catton is the most significant book he's ever read in his life. Uh, many other scholars feel similarly. So I've spent the last eight years, between 20 and 50 hours a week, studying the rise and fall of civilizations, climate change, abrupt climate change, ecology, and I've compressed over the last eight years, 12,000 to probably 14,000 hours worth of study and research, and crystallized it, distilled it into three and a half hours, three videos, Collapse 101, The Inevitable Fruit of Progress, Post Gloom, Deeply Adapting to Reality, and Sustainability 101, Indigenuity is Not Optional. And now I'm pretty much retired. I'm living two blocks from my granddaughter, my now nine-month-old granddaughter uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And basically what I do now is I do homilies, 15 to 20-minute Zoom homilies and sermons. These are two samples up online. And then I do 60 to 90-minute Q&A on, on basically this program, what you're watching now, usually scheduled three to 10 days after the homily. So let's take this one at a time. Sustainable versus unsustainable. Why progress breeds ecocide and denial. I love these quotes. 
Do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And Robin Wall Kimmer wrote a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, which is one of the top 10 books I've ever read in my life. So what is the nature of the society that you live in? What's the nature of our society? Well, throughout human history, for the first 95% of human history, we lived more or less sustainable. That is, we lived in stable societies that were within nature's normal cycles and rhythms. There was a sense of being committed to the future. The future, I mean, acting as if the, the seventh generation judges what we do in the present isn't just a good idea to do otherwise is evil. So acting in a pro-future way, it's ahistorical. There were daily and seasonal ups and downs. There were no human-made calendars or clocks. There was no sense of progress. Even technological change in terms of, you know, weapons and stuff like that changed so slowly over many generations. And then the last 10,000 years or so, we've had exploitative cultures and consequential cultures for three and a roughly 3% of human history. There was, you know, you talk about the rise and fall, boom and bust, progress, regress. So exploitative cultures, usually around one to three centuries, there's a sense of expansion and growth, carrying capacity surplus, but this is often because of slavery and colonization. And it wasn't so much anti-future as just dismissive of the future. And progress for the elites, at least, I mean, obviously not for the slaves, isn't just a belief, it's an obvious fact. And then there's the age of consequences, roughly 2%, which is, it typically falls faster. Most societies fall faster than they rise. It's known as the Seneca curve. Carrying capacity deficit. There's a contraction of in-group and contraction of everything, really, post-exuberant age. The wealth gap widens and unworkability and denial reign supreme. Things that worked last month, last week, last year, last decade don't work now. And that keeps getting worse as the future goes, and denial reigns supreme. Now, where do you think we are today? Well, I'll let Robert Louis Stevenson say it. Sooner or later, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. This is the great reckoning. I love this quote from John Michael Greer. The first law of life is limits. Sustainable means honoring limits. Unsustainable means dishonoring limits. Will we realize that this is what the fall is pointing to before we go extinct? By the way, it's not cool to quote yourself. My name is Michael Brian Patrick Dowd. <laughs> so sustainable means stable. And there's tons of really ridiculous stuff. In fact, even if you Google sustainability, you'll get Wikipedia pages that start with, with civilization. This is crazy. Teddy Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith, was the founder and the publisher of The Ecologist magazine for almost 40 years before he died. The Stable Society and The Way, an ecological worldview, really are the best evidential understanding of the last 500 years in terms of what does anthropology tell us is the difference between sustainable cultures, stable cultures, and unsustainable cultures. And then Rick Reese, Richard Adrian Reese, What is Sustainable, and his new book, Wild, Free, and Happy. It's all available up online. I've recorded the whole thing. The audio is also available for free. These, If you want to understand sustainability, you've got to read Teddy Goldsmith or Rick Reese. This is the first 96% of human history. This is 400,000 years, 20,000 generations. And as indigenous scholars would remind us, or indigenous leaders, sustainable means faithful. It means faithful to the past, the ancestors, faithful to the future, the descendants, and faithful to the body of life. Stan Rushworth has written, uh, he's working with Dar Jamel right now on, on a new book. And then Julia Watson, Low Tech, Designed by Radical Indigenism. And then Robin Wall Kimmer, I mentioned before, is one of the top 10 books I've ever read in my life. And I share this slide because sometimes people think that we're just an ecocidal species. No, there are ecocidal cultures. These articles by Max Wilbert are humans inherently destructive. And make sure you see the four linked articles in the interview at the end of this excellent essay. Humans Naturally Destructive by Dirk Jensen. It's an excerpt from his book, Endgame. And then Eileen Christ, Confronting Anthropocentrism. This book, I'm just now in the middle of reading it. 
Jack Forbes, Columbus and Other Cannibals. It's phenomenal. But if you don't have time to read these book length treatments, which all clearly say that there's a profound difference between ecocidal cultures and pro-future cultures. But if you don't have time to read one of the book length, just read these essays. It's profound. This is the way we think of religion and science in unsustainable cultures. And yet in sustainable cultures, this is the way it is. Science and religion feed each other. In fact, it's not even known as religion, it's life ways. I talk about this in spades in my Sustainability 101 Indigenuity is not optional video. So Ugo Bardi is a dear friend and colleague. He talked about the Seneca effect, understanding systemic collapse, why growth is slow, but collapse is rapid. And he quotes Seneca, the path of increase is slow, but the road to ruin is swift. And then Peter Turchin is a polymath who's written a number of books. This he co-authored Secular Cycles, Ultra Society, How 10,000 Years of War Made Humans the Greatest Cooperators on Earth. And these are folks that take a look at the big picture, like the whole of human civilizations, and notice the common patterns that we find throughout. It turns out that unsustainable means progress, regress, rise and fall, boom and bust. This is just the last 5% of human history. It's 8,000 years, 400 generations, as opposed to 20,000 generations. And there are scores of examples. There's actually more than 100 examples. And this roughly takes between 220 and 350 years. We see a progress, that is rise, boom, overshooting carrying capacity. That is, we use more resources and exude more waste than the systems can bear. And so the, the natural systems start breaking down. And then regress, fall, the bust. And denial reigns and addictions do. Plato wrote 2,500 years ago that as societies collapse, addictions of all kinds ramp up. The interesting thing is the inner reality, what, what our expectations are. If you're born and you die in times of expansion and times of progress, well, of course you know that your children and grandchildren are going to have it better than you. And if you're born and you die in times of decline, in times of regress, well, of course you expect things are going to get worse. It's when you're born in times of expansion and it shifts in your lifetime, that's what we call suffering. And that's where all of us are now. Here's the classic pattern of scores of anthropocentric, that is city-based, human-centered agricultural civilizations. The well-being of the elites and ruling class, what gets called wealth and progress goes up, while the well-being of the bioregion and the habitat, that is carrying capacity, real wealth goes down. And you don't understand this unless you understand ecology, energy, and history. And I'm going to cite several resources because I've recorded most of these. These are the, this is where I ground my understanding. This book, John Perlin, A Forest Journey, The Story of Wood and Civilizations. This is, a, this is an amazing book because it details in, in a way that's really relentless how society after society after society uses the trees, the trees get cut down, the soil washes away, and the civilization collapses. This happens over and over and over again. Geodestinies by Walter Youngquist, the inevitable control of earth resources over nations and individuals. A New Green History of the World by Clive Ponting, the environment and the collapse of great civilizations. And then, of course, the classic William Catton's overshoot, the ecological basis of revolutionary change. Here are some universal human needs. That is, these are, this is, this is at all humans at all times in every culture throughout human history. These are our basic needs. If these needs aren't met, it's like we're a caged animal. We start experiencing psychosis of one form or another. Habitable climate and healthy, non-toxic air, water, food, and shelter. The need to belong to and connect with a safe and engaging community, starting with attachment to one's mother in the first critical years of life, the need for meaning and purpose in one's life, including meaningful work, the need to be valued, appreciated, and heard, the need to be optimistic, or at least relatively positive, about the future for oneself and one's loved ones, the need for control and a degree of autonomy over one's life and work, the need to be in regular intimate communion with the living world, the need for a sense of place and home. 
and the need for freedom from chronic stress, financial, physical, etc., and the time and space to recover from it, including getting adequate sleep. I first learned about this from Dave Pollard. He wrote a blog post called Cultural Acedia, When We Can No Longer Care. And he cites these other scholars there at the bottom. And I want to emphasize, these basic universal human needs are met in spades in pro-future, that is sustainable cultures, cultures that live in a mutually enhancing relationship with primary reality, the living world. Most of these are not met in unsustainable cultures and certainly not met in industrial civilization. So I created a video a few years ago called Sane versus Insane Progress. It's about 23 minutes long. It's up on YouTube. Here are the main points. How we define and measure progress determines our behavior and what kind of a world that we're leaving our grandchildren and other species. Banking on technofix or political solutions will lead to catastrophic nuclear meltdowns and incalculable needless extinctions. Problems caused by economic growth and development will not be solved by more of the same. Indeed, our predicament will worsen. And understanding ecology, energy, and history undermines expectations that human ingenuity, technology, or the market can save industrial civilization. Turns out that ingenuity, technology, and the market is what got us into this mess in the first place. These are my two most significant male mentors, William Catton and Thomas Berry. Catton, author of Overshoot, I love this quote. He says, human society is inextricably part of a global biotic community. And in that community, human dominance has had and is having self-destructive consequences. Thomas Berry is the author of The Dream of the Earth and The Great Work and a number of other books. He's one of the most significant ecological and evolutionary thinkers of the 20th century. And, and this quote is along similar lines. He says, the most difficult transition to make is from a human-centered to a life-centered or ecocentric norm of progress. If there's to be any true progress, the entire life community must progress. Any so-called progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself. And this makes total sense when you understand the nested nature of reality. We are part of and dependent upon smaller creative intelligent realities like our microbiome, for example, that we couldn't exist without. And we're dependent upon larger creative intelligent realities like the trees and plants and animals and this sort of thing. And so primary realities, everything inside us and outside us that we don't exist without. And all indigenous cultures knew that you treat primary reality as primary. In fact, if you don't, <laughs> you're going to cause your own, your own demise. I talk about this in detail in my Sustainability 101 video. I love this quote from a dear colleague, Richard Heinberg. Our biggest problem is not climate change. It is overshoot, of which global warming is a symptom. William Catton talks about, in his book Overshoot, the difference between problems which can be potentially solved and predicaments that we have to adapt to, live with. Climate change, ocean acidification, topsoil desecration and loss, the sixth major mass extinction, critical resource depletion, chemical and nuclear wastes, the growing gulf between the rich and the poor, economic instability and insanity, political dysfunction, the shrinking of in-groups, and the rise of totalitarianism and other isms. These are things that we activists are all about confronting. And yet all of these are symptoms. They're not the problem. These are symptoms of ecological overshoot, every one of them. And overshoot is itself an expression of anthropocentrism, human-centeredness, human-centered hubris that can take a religious form or a secular form. Having a human-centered, otherworldly, only supernatural notion of God is a notion of anthropocentrism, but also a secular God, progress, technology, the market. Both of these are forms of anthropocentric hubris. I love John Michael Greer's definition. He actually got it from the Greeks. Hubris is the overweening pride of the doomed. So we think of collapse and we often think of like a collapse of a building. And I'm not talking about it that way at all. I'm talking about collapse of ecosystems, the collapse of societies, the collapse of civilizations, which takes many, many, many decades, often a century or two. 
Collapse from this perspective is when a gradual downward trend in biophysical health and well-being goes into unstoppable decline, runaway, out of control, such as abrupt climate change. In fact, if you don't understand collapse in terms of ecosystem collapse, you're not going to realize that most of the redwood forests in California are in collapse. The, these, these great redwoods, they look fine, but they're not producing cones except when they're artificially watered. Collapse is when a gradual downward trend goes into unstoppable decline, out of control, irreversible. Collapse is a process, not an event. I remember seeing a few years ago, George Lakoff on his Facebook page posted this quote from Joseph Brodsky. Brodsky was a Russian polymath. He was brilliant. He was a, a literature professor who taught at some of the most prestigious universities in the United States and Canada. He won the Nobel Prize in literature in 1987. And he famously said this quote. He said, you Americans are so naive. You think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots. It doesn't happen like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. In my Collapse 101 video, The Inevitable Fruit of Progress, I take a look at how we name and language wealth, success, progress, and development. If we interpret wealth, success, progress, and development in human-centered ways, we cause our own extinction. If we interpret them in life-centered, ecocentric ways, we can survive. And in Sustainability 101, Indigenuity is not optional, I also take a look at God, religion, nature, and the environment. How these terms are identified, how these terms are defined, what we mean when we use these words makes a profound difference in terms of either sustainable or unsustainable. In fact, Thomas Berry famously said, the environment is not our surroundings, it's our source, sustenance, and end. Here's another distinction. What do we normally think of when we think of primitive and civilized? Well, these quotes are going to call that into question. Forests precede civilizations and deserts follow them. All of our exalted technological progress, civilization for that matter, is comparable to an ax in the hand of a pathological criminal. The end of the human race will be that it will eventually die of civilization. The earth is littered with the ruins of empires and civilizations that once believed that they were eternal. Back two years ago in February of 2019, the BBC Future series did a deep civilization series. And there was an article by Luke Kemp called, Are We on the Road to Civilizational Collapse? Of course, he answered yes. And he has this amazing chart that shows 88 civilizations and how long each of them was. And this is just from 3000 BCE until 1000 of the Common Era. So this is just for that 4000 year period, 88 civilizations. If you go back before 3000 BCE, I mean, this is before writing, so we don't have a lot of evidence. But and if you look at the last 1000 years, it's actually well over 100. And what we learn is that collapse is a feature of civilizations. It's not a bug. That is, collapse is part of the DNA of human-centered, anthropocentric civilizations. So we've just looked at sustainable versus unsustainable, why progress breeds ecocide and denial. Now let's look at abrupt climate collapse. What is inevitable? What is futile? And what does enlightened mean? And I encourage you to actually stop and take a breath, <laughs> take a break, and then come back to this. Please note, the post-apocalyptical fiction section has been moved to current affairs. And I'll just shut up. Just take a look at this. So when we look at the last 270 years since 1750, okay, this is the Industrial Revolution, guy instability, that is real wealth, we see a downward gradual trend and then going into an unstoppable decline in the last two to seven decades. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and in unstoppable out of control runaway mode for two to seven decades. This is known as the Great Acceleration. And if you just Google Great Acceleration, you'll find all kinds of charts that show like this. 
And the ones on the left are socioeconomic trends, and it shows you know world population and and uh, primary energy use, large dams, water use, fertilizer consumption, transportation, tourism, and so forth. And on the right, it's Earth system trends: carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, and so forth, shrimp ag aquaculture. Um, terrestrial biosphere degradation, they're all going up, which actually means they're going down in terms of habitability. So let's call these trends what they are. These are on the left, they're ecocidal trends. And the right, it's earth system collapse. So what this is, is really the great acceleration of Gaian collapse, that is biospheric collapse in terms of human habitability. Sure, it might be fine for reptiles, but it's not fine for mammals. So when we come back to this great acceleration, and again, don't take my word on it, just Google great acceleration. We're seeing a precipitous decline, a collapse in the last seven decades. Climate, Holocene stability, that is the stability that allowed for growing grain at scale and allowed for civilizations to emerge is now collapsing. CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, mass extinction of plants and animals. In fact, it turns out that there was only one of the past six great mass extinctions where we lost the insects in the forest. And we're now accelerating faster than that. The oceans, plankton, corals, fish, acidification and ocean rise. If all human beings went extinct tonight, like let's say some virus wiped us all out tonight, the seas would continue to rise 20 to 40 feet over the next 200 years, regardless. This is unstoppable. Soil, the amount of soil, the fertility of the soil, the moisture of the soil, and permafrost. We're already into unstoppable, out of control permafrost where the methane is being released. We can't stop it. And then ice. Arctic sea ice, Antarctica, Greenland, mountain glaciers. Most people have no idea that this, the loss of ice, is the single most important thing in terms of what's driving abrupt climate change. If I encourage you to read The End of Ice by Dar Jamel, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. It's phenomenal. And then Peter Wadhams, one of the top scientists in the world, A Farewell to Ice, a report from the Arctic. See, abrupt climate change is like 10,000 years of climate change in just a few decades, in half a human lifetime. And most of the scientists that study abrupt climate change say somewhere between 1985, mid-1980s, and 2000 is where we have seen it go into unstoppable runaway mode. In fact, meteorologist Nick Humphrey, this 27-minute YouTube video by Nick Humphrey, he's one of my go-to people on abrupt climate change, as is Paul Beckwith, but ongoing abrupt climate change and consequences. This 27-minute YouTube video is actually a summary of his 16-part series. It's a summary overview of his 16-part series, which I've recorded the whole thing. In fact, if you just Google SoundCloud Dowd Nick Humphrey, you'll get my audio narration of all 16 of these posts. But this is, a, this is like a, an educational primer on abrupt climate change, as is this. Just a few months ago, I uploaded my post-Doom conversation with Robert Hunsaker, one of the most prophetic journalists alive. He's right up there with Dar Jamel. And this is called Abrupt Climate Change, the World Tour. And he takes us around the world. He starts in Antarctica, Australia, the Amazon rainforest, the oceans, Greenland, and the Arctic. And he goes region by region. And this is, I mean, if you watch Nick Humphrey and this, you will have the best education on abrupt climate change, which is not the same thing as gradual climate change. It's like 10,000 years of a climate change in a half a human lifetime. When most of the Arctic ice is gone, the serious global warming begins. Learn about phase change and latent heat. I can talk about this more in the Q&A session that'll follow this. And if you think billionaires are going to be able to isolate in like, you know, New Zealand and other places, watch this video, Maz Alone by Ken Avador. It is profound. You will realize that it's a total delusion that thinking that the billionaires are going to be able to save themselves. There are 440 nuclear reactors worldwide, requiring us to assume that industrial civilization has everlasting life, eternal life. Yet we are already 20 to 30 years into abrupt runaway climate change. Nick Humphrey says that it's been the mid 80s. Hunsinger agrees that it's possible that's the case, but he certainly says 2000. But we're at least 20 or 30 years into abrupt runaway climate change. 
So here's the 64 million year question, not 64 million dollars, 64 million year. As industrial civilization continues to collapse faster and faster, how many Chernobyl or Fukushima-like or worse meltdowns due to wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, power grid failures, political instability, or terrorism do you think are possible, likely, inevitable? Here are 10 things that I think are certain, inevitable. In fact, I mean, they may not be 100% certain or 100% inevitable, but they're at least 98 or 99% certain, 98 or 99% inevitable. The first is massive denial, grief, and blame. We see this in every previous collapsed civilization. We see massive denial, grief, and blame. And I'm not the only one speaking about like our denial instinct. Arguably, the best book that's ever been written on the topic is Varky and Brower's Denial. Self-Deception, False Beliefs, and the Origin of the Human Mind. This is a profound book. I first learned about it from Rob Malkarski, his undenial.com website, Unmasking Denial, Creator and Destroyer. Now, I don't agree with everything with Rob, but I agree with the vast majority, and his website, Undenial, is fabulous. I highly recommend it. He, he considers himself Varky's bulldog. He promotes this book so highly. Here's Denial. The largely unconscious habit of thought whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. We all are prone to denial. We all have denial instincts. I do, you do, everybody does so we can have compassion for ourselves and each other. I've heard of denial. I just don't believe in it. Burying my head in the sand over climate change is much easier now that half the world has turned to desert. It's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. And who of us can't relate to this? My desire to be well-informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. Grief. I love this quote from Joanna Macy. The depth of your grief is the measure of your love. You wouldn't be feeling grief if you didn't love. And then this quote from Stephen Jenkinson. Grief requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. And need I say anything about blame? We're certainly seeing that all over the place now. BOE, blue ocean event, permafrost and methane. A blue ocean event is when the first time that in September, it'll happen for the first time in September, could be this September, it might not be for a decade, but sometime in the next decade, we're going to have the first blue ocean event, which means no ice in the Arctic in September. And the first time that happens within a dozen years, we're likely to see no ice in the Arctic year round. And all of this heat that was being reflected, bouncing off the white ice is now being absorbed into the dark blue ocean, shallow sea in the Arctic. And of course, this becomes runaway. So we're seeing permafrost, the incredible release of methane. And this is already in unstoppable mode. We, we can't stop this. This is inevitable. This is certain. Which means chaotic, deadly jet stream. It's, it's that heat in the Arctic that's causing the jet stream to become, become much loopier. My, grand, my, uh, my oldest granddaughter, who's 10 years old, lives in Houston, Texas. Texas dealt with an amazing freeze. In fact, much of the South dealt with an amazing freeze. This is because the jet stream is all loopy and we're in dealing with intensely unstable weather. We're looking at the, the inevitability of a multi-bread basket failure. That is where two or more of the, the five grain growing regions of the world fail in the same year. If three or more fail in the same year, you're looking at a billion or two billion or three billion people dying within 10 months. And this is because of this heat in the Arctic that's 
wag wagging out. We've lost the Holocene stability that allowed for the growing of grain at scale and allowed for civilization to emerge. The great conflagration of forests is inevitable. Not all the forests of the world, but most of the forests of the world are going to burn. In the Amazon, in Siberia, in Australia, the West, California, Washington, the boreal forest, we're seeing the force of the world, the great burning, the great conflagration of force. This is already in unstoppable mode. Not all the forests of the world, but the vast majority are going to burn in the next 20 or 40 years. Ocean acidification. We're going to lose the corals. This is inevitable now. And inundation, as I mentioned before, if all humans died tonight, the seas would continue to rise 20 to 40 feet over the next 200 years. This is unstoppable. Mass extinction, plants and animals. We're already in the sixth great mass extinction. Population bottleneck. That's an academic way of saying that billions of people are going to die in the next decade or two. Mass migrations. What's happening now in Syria and Venezuela and other parts of the world is just the beginning. Mexico is expected to be like the Sahara Desert. Where are those people going to go? They're going to go north. They're going to go south. And no wall is going to stop them. Conflicts. We see this in every collapsed civilization, without exception. We see growing wars and conflicts. And then there will be some nuclear meltdowns. There may not be 400 nuclear meltdowns, but there's certainly going to be at least a dozen or two. And what we do in the next decade is profoundly determinative. That's why it's a sacred responsibility to do everything we can to prevent as much nuclear toxicity as possible to take the fuel rods, the, the spent fuel rods out of the swimming pools and put them in someplace safe like Yucca Mountain and other places. This is a sacred responsibility. This is what we need to do to avoid being evil on a geological time scale. And did I mention massive denial, grief and blame? You don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. None of us wants to hear this. Climate denial isn't just on the right. It's not just the fossil fuel companies who say climate change isn't real or humans aren't the cause of it. Climate denial is pervasive on the left. It's overshoot denial. This movie, this documentary, Planet of the Humans by Jeff Gibbs, Michael Moore, this was trashed by the liberals and progressives. Most of my friends and colleagues trashed this movie and they were citing all of the reviews that trashed it. And yet all of the reviews that trashed this movie didn't understand the main point, which is that we are in ecological overshoot. That's a fact, not a belief. And no technology, not green technology, no market solutions, even green capitalism is going to save us. In fact, these resources, Planet of the Humans, review, shining a light on the energy black box by Megan Seberg or Seibert. Crossroads for Planet of the Humans by Bill Reese, William Reese, one of the top ecologists on the planet. Planet of the Humans, Why Technology Won't Save Us by Elizabeth Robson. And then Max Wilbert and Jennifer Mernon on the Green Flame podcast interviewed director Jeff Gibbs. I encourage you, if you, which I imagine most of the people watching this are going to be people who still believe that if we just shift to renewables, green technology, wind power, solar panels, that's going to save us. And please take time to read these because these are devastating critiques of the critiquers of this film. And then this book coming out next month by Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, and Max Wilbert, Bright Green Lies. They sent me a review copy. It is phenomenal. It is a detailed chapter by chapter scathing attack on all of the different ways that so-called renewables are gonna save us. It's a, it's a delusion. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we're gonna to attend to what matters most, which is capping the nukes, preventing the worst toxicity and moving trees. I'll say more about that. So solutionism, the idea that everything has a solution and usually technological, eco-modernism, techno-optimism, techno-utopianism, all of these, are versions of techno-idolatry. Not idolatry is bowing down to statues or believing in the wrong God, but putting your faith or trust in technology. That, that's going to save us. I love this bizarro cartoon. How about if your generation spends less time studying how my generation destroyed the environment and more time figuring out a magical solution? Climate restoration is a fancy way of saying geoengineering, the idea that we're going to manage the biosphere. It's insane. 
nets, negative emissions technologies. Sure, there are negative emissions processes like planting trees, but this technological understanding and BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and, store and storage. These are assumed in the IPCC models. These are what's assumed that are gonna work and they're not gonna work, they can't work. In fact, if you wanna know what some of the top scientists in the world say about this techno idolatry, I mean, that's my term, Kevin Anderson, just Google carbon sucking unicorns and see what some of the top scientists, including Kevin Anderson are saying about this insanity. Joseph Tainer in his famous book, The Collapse of Complex Societies, talked about when we use technology and complexity to solve problems caused by technology and complexity, we reach a point of diminishing returns where the more we add complexity and technology, the worse it makes things. And this book, Technofix, Why Technology Won't Save Us or the Environment. This is a profound book. The first six or seven pages of the book are all endorsements. Here are the main points of this book. Human technology that doesn't integrate with life's technology does more harm than good. It just does it over time. Technology in the context of ongoing economic growth does not promote sustainability, but hastens collapse. Most technological solutions to social and technology-created problems are counterproductive. And this book shows why new technologies tend to be uncritically accepted, who really controls the direction of change, and why technology expands and accelerates ecocide. So, you know that old 12-step prayer, God, life, reality, help me accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So we want to be able to accept what's inevitable, what's certain, but we also don't want to invest in what's futile. So I suggest that these things are futile hoping or wishing for everlasting progress, or if we all just... It turns out that in every previous collapsed civilization, there are those who stay in denial and believe that progress is going to continue. And there are also those that believe if we all just... It never happens. But it's also futile to expect your loved ones to not hope or believe in one of these delusions so we can have compassion for ourselves and each other. Assuming that technology or the market can sustain what is unsustainable, it's futile. Faith in the techno ecocidal religion of everlasting growth on a finite planet, that too is, is futile. Expecting our mismatched instincts to not at least occasionally challenge us. Connie and I did programs for over a decade on evolutionary psychology and brain science. I'll talk a little bit about this in a few minutes, but our, our mismatched instincts living in a world of supernormal stimuli are going to challenge us occasionally. Denying that impermanence, death, and extinction are real and necessary. Expecting the elite and the powerful to reject anthropocentrism, that is to reject human centeredness prior to collapse, it's not going to happen. And expecting industrial civilization and global capitalism to run on renewable energy. It's not going to happen. And the most liberals and progressives, this is where we still hope. And expecting your technophile and planmeister friends to not call you a doomer for giving up, quote unquote. Again, that goes back to number two, expecting your loved ones to not hope or believe in these delusions. Technophile means those who love technology and planmeister means those who believe that if we just have the right plan, we can all make it. Those, your friends that are still in that place, they're going to call you a doomer. They're going to say you give up. Just love them. Just accept them. Inattention, that is not paying attention to the world's ecological state, is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening may have meant in other times and other cultures, if you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. If you only watch one thing beyond this video that you're watching now, I recommend this documentary, Living in a Time of Dying. Michael Shaw, it's an amazing documentary. In fact, he interviewed me as part of his series, his Living in the Time of Dying series. I called it Post-Doom Compost Theology, but I highly recommend that documentary. 
So I encourage you to stop here, pause, take a break, take a breath, you know, go for a walk, whatever, and then come back here. So these last two sections, sobering inspiration, honoring who, what, and where we really are, and now what? Living meaningfully and courageously at Teotihuacan, that is the end of the world as we know it. These two sections are actually almost identical to the last half of my post-gloom, deeply adapting to reality video. The first half of that is on evolutionary psychology and brain science, which I'm not covering hardly at all in this video. So who are we? What are we? And where are we in time and space? Why do we struggle with reality, temptation, and addiction? What is our undeniable identity and essence? And why are non-native cultures, that is, civilized folk, so death-phobic? And then where are we in the life cycle of our civilization? Why we struggle, suffer, and are so easily addicted and distracted. I'm not going to go into this in any depth here. I do that the whole first half of the post-gloom video. But we have mismatched instincts. We live in a world of super normal stimuli. And we have instincts of denial. Homo denial are us. I believe that history will show that one of the greatest psychological and spiritual realizations of the 20th century was the discovery that human beings have powerful, indeed compelling instincts, just like all other animals do. And that if we don't humble ourselves before primary reality, life, Gaia, God, prioritize the future and respect, that is honor and harness our inherited drives, we are bound to be enslaved to them. Here are some of the emotional and practical benefits from understanding our evolved instincts. We can have gratitude for what we've inherited. We're not confused anymore. We can move beyond denial, guilt, and resentment. We can have compassion for ourselves and others. In fact, I know of a, a woman who's a neurobiologist who said, you know, the more I learn about how the brain works, the more compassion that I have for myself and others. Isn't it amazing how science is giving us access to the spiritual virtue? It can help heal broken relationships. And we develop a witness capacity that isn't just like sitting on a cushion witness. It's an evolutionary witness where we understand our brains and why, why we do what we do and why we're tempted. And my, te my first TEDx talk was on why we struggle now in 2012. And it's all on evolutionary psychology and brain science. So who are we? Who are you? I love this quote from Percy Shelley. I am the eye with which the universe beholds itself and knows it is divine. Carl Sagan famously said, we are the local embodiment of a cosmos grown to self-awareness. We've begun to contemplate our origins, star stuff, pondering the stars. Brian Swim has a couple of quotes. He, Brian Swim co-authored uh, with uh, Thomas Berry, The Universe Story. He's one of my most significant older brothers on this path. He says, four billion years ago, the earth was molten rock and now it sings opera. He's got another quote. He says, you can sum up the whole universe story in two sentences. You take a great cloud of hydrogen gas and you just leave it alone. And it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. I mean, if that's not a sacred story, nothing is. Earth is our larger body. It's our larger self. This isn't, this isn't so much a picture of a human being looking at the earth. This is a piece of the earth that's gotten off itself looking back at itself. Joanna Macy is probably my most significant female mentor. Her work, the work that reconnects. I first learned about Joanna in the mid-1980s. Uh, this book here, Coming Back to Life, is a fabulous introduction to the work that reconnects. I first learned about her in this book, Thinking Like a Mountain Toward a Council of All Beings, and then Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. I just had a conversation with Joanna just a few days ago where I asked her about this because there's a new version of this coming out in a couple months. And I said, how do you now interpret Active Hope? And she said, I hope that we can collapse well. And if extinction is in the cards, I hope that we can go extinct with dignity. And I'm active to see those happen. And I'm encouraging others. That's active hope. I love it. 
This is her latest book, A Wild Love for the World. And then this is the 30th anniversary issue of, uh, of, of World as Lover, World as Self. One of the most important books I've ever read in my life because that's the indigenous mindset. That's the only sustainable mindset. World as Lover, World as Self. Industrialism has been treating it as world as larder, world as toilet. Unsustainable. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or the fear because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. I love Joanna Macy and her work. This quote is fabulous, Alice O'Keefe. Even if we can't escape its consequences, it is not too late to escape the mindset that brought us here. Daniel Wildcat is a Native American teacher and elder. We live among relatives, not resources. The universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The environment is not our surroundings, it's our source, sustenance, and the end. I go into that indigenous mindset, uh, an indigenous native heart and mind in much more detail in my Sustainability 101, Indigenuity is not optional video. I also talk about how the religions, the great religions of the world can become ecocentric. I take a look at Christianity, the core aspects of Christianity, sin, salvation, the kingdom of God, heaven and hell, Jesus as the way, the truth and the life. And I interpret them from an indigenous ecocentric perspective. So you'll find that in that Sustainability 101 video. The sacred necessity of impermanence and death. For many years, Connie and I did programs on a sacred science approach, a meaningful, inspiring scientific approach to mortality, impermanence, and death. We took a look at the major sciences that have anything to do with death, paleontology, evolutionary biology, embryology, cell biology, and ecology, astronomy and astrophysics, geology and geography and math. And then we take a look at the major scientific discoveries in each of those areas that have helped us come to an understanding that there's not only nothing wrong with death, there's something profoundly right with death. You can't have a universe without death. And so we created, Connie created this litany that's been used in secular and religious settings, the gifts of death. Because when we cherish mortality and realize that death could be imminent, what matters most becomes blazingly obvious. Mountains die, oceans die, continents die. Without the death of species, there would be no complex life. Without the death of fetal cells in the embryonic stage of development, we'd all be spheres. The reason we have shape is because cells died here, 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 and here. Without the death of plants and animals, there would be no food. And this is obvious when we think about it. We're just not used to thinking about death in a positive way. Without the death of stars, there would be no periodic table of elements, no planets, and no life. Without the death of elders, there would be no room for children. I mean, think about it. In a finite world, if all you have is birth with no death, pretty quickly you're wall-to-wall -wall people, wall-to-wall -wall skunks, wall-to-wall -wall bacteria 60 feet deep. It doesn't take long. Without death, there would be no ancestors. Without death, time would not be precious. What then are the gifts of death? The gifts of death are Mars and Mercury, Saturn and Earth. The gifts of death are the atoms of stardust within our bodies. The gifts of death are the splendors of shape and form and color. The gifts of death are diversity, the immense journey of life. The gifts of death are food, the sustenance of life. The gifts of death are seeing, hearing, feeling, deeply feeling. The gifts of death are the urgency to act, the desire to fully be and become. The gifts of death are joy and sorrow, laughter and tears. The gifts of death are lives that are fully and exuberantly lived, then graciously and gratefully given up for now and forevermore. Amen. Death, it turns out, is natural and necessary at every level of reality, and thus death is no less sacred than life. Connie and I visit graveyards all the time. This is actually just about six blocks away from here. This is the Highland Cemetery here in, uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan. 
And I love to stand in front of a gravestone. And, you know, I look at the dates and I think to myself, and I do this all the time. I've done this for decades. Whatever this person may have believed about his or her soul or spirit or consciousness, whatever their beliefs were that helped them live a great life, hey, I'm just a bow of respect to that. But from the perspective of every life form in the universe, this person is everlastingly dead. And I'm soon going to be just as everlastingly dead. And by reminding myself of that, it helps me not put off my legacy work. David Brooks wrote a piece on honorable versus dishonorable death back in, uh, I think it was 2011, Death and Budgets. He's one of my favorite conservative columnists at the New York Times. He says, we think the budget mess is a squabble between partisans in Washington, but it's in large measure about our inability to face debt and our willingness as a nation to spend whatever it takes to push it just slightly over the horizon. And we're sure seeing this in a COVID era. There are super normal medical technologies that our ancestors never had to deal with. In fact, for many years, I did programs on a sacred understanding of death and largely to people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, liberal and progressive congregations, Unitarian Universalist and Christian and other. And I would show this slide in my evening talk and I'd say, now imagine this guy's 82 years old and he had a great legacy. He made a huge difference. And then the last five months of his life, he was kept alive like this at the cost of 48 college educations. What's his net legacy? It's kind of mixed. And everybody's head nodded. We are dealing with physical suffering, emotional distress, family discord, and societal cost because we're not able to accept the sacredness and the normalness of death. Until we grasp that death plays a vital and necessary role in an evolving cosmos. Christianity will be shackled, continue to be shackled by otherworldly notions of the gospel, as if the, the great news is merely cosmic fire insurance. Medical technologies will continue to prolong physical and emotional suffering and provoke family discord. The medical industry will continue to underwrite the widening gap between the rich and the poor, and seniors and their families will continue to be seduced into perhaps the greatest generational injustice and legacy diminishing evil in history. Stephen Jenkinson is an amazing death worker. This documentary, it's an hour and 10 minutes long, Grief Walker, you can find it up online, it's free. And then his book, Die Wise, and he's written a couple of others since. I highly recommend Stephen Jenkinson's work. This is my post-doom conversation that Barbara Cecil and I had with Stephen Jenkinson. Not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. So where are we? We looked at who we are and what we are. Where are we in the life cycle of our civilization? Well, I showed this chart before. We see this pattern in over and over, dozens, scores of previous unsustainable civilizations. And we're, of course, in overshoot. <laughs> Here's where we are, right? These are the ways that denial sounds today. We are at risk of civilizational collapse. It's not too late to win the climate war. We can solve the crisis and get to net zero emissions. The window of opportunity for bold action is closing. Green technology, green growth can reverse global warming. It's still possible to avoid societal collapse. Without fill in the blank, we're doomed. These are all forms of denial. I suspect this is probably where you are, and certainly most of your congregants, fellow congregants, and friends and neighbors. This is where most of us are at. And yet, these are not the case. It's not without whatever we're doomed. We're doomed. Now what? This is a New York Times bestselling book by Roy Scranton. And then his other book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Reflections on the End of a Civilization. We have to start with that. It doesn't mean we stay in despair. We don't stay in doom. In fact, that's why I've given my life, <laughs> the rest of my life is in a post-doom. I've had 75 conversations, regenerative conversations, exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I encourage you to go to postdoom.com and especially read the three definitions of doom and the three definitions of post-doom. I'll be covering those when I, in the Q&A um, that, uh, that I'll be doing with this, but check it out. You can get a preview there. 
I love this quote from Kate Marvel. She's a climate scientist. We need courage, not hope, to face climate change. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. And then Cyril Connolly, optimism and self-pity are the positive and negative poles of modern cowardice. And then Oswald Spengler, one of the famous historians of civilizations, when a civilization is in decline, optimism is cowardice. So I encourage you to stop, pause, take a break, take a walk, and then come back for this last section. So we looked at sustainable versus unsustainable, why progress breeds ecocide and denial. Took a look at abrupt climate collapse, what's inevitable, what's futile, and what is enlightened. Sobering inspiration, celebrating who, what, and where we really are. Now we're going to focus for the last section on now what? Living meaningfully and courageously at Teotihuacan. As the Dark Mountain Manifesto says, the end of the world as we know it does not mean the end of the world full stop. Living meaningfully and courageously. Learn and feel together. Learn about deep adaptation together and feel the stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Feel them with others. Nurture pro-future hopes and do so in community. See, there's anti-future hopes and there's pro-future hopes. Uh, hope is not neutral. Hope is like liquid. You know, you say, do you have liquid? Well, some liquids will kill you and some liquids will sustain you. Some hopes, some things that we hope in or hope for actually lead us to behave and act in ways and support policies that are actually harmful to the future. So we need to avoid anti-future hopes and put our hopes in things that are actually pro-future. So hoping for or expecting anything that would cause us to not prioritize sparing the future our deadliest toxicity, saving thousands of species of trees and plants, and learning and applying regenerative and native wisdom. I'll say more about these uh, in a few minutes. But anything that we do that causes us to not prioritize those three things is an anti-future hope. Pro-future hope, I love this quote from William Catton in his book, Overshoot. Today, humankind is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. Human self-restraint, practiced both individually and especially collectively, is our indispensable hope. And degrowth, decolonization, resilience, and deep adaptation are all profoundly effective ways of practicing human self-restraint. I highly recommend all four of those things. In fact, Deep Adaptation, there's a book that'll be coming out this summer, uh, summer of 2021, called Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. I only learned about this yesterday, but Jim Bendel's amazing paper, I mean, most academic papers are read by, you know, a few dozen people. Over a million people have downloaded his Deep Adaptation paper. It's gone viral. And there's a Deep Adaptation Facebook group, Deep Adaptation Forum, a professional network, my interview, I, I had an amazing conversation with Jim Bendel. In fact, it was the very first post-doom conversation in a coronavirus era. And then I've recorded about two dozen of his blog posts, including his deep adaptation paper. So check that out just at uh, SoundCloud, Jim Bendel. Honor your sadness and grief. We're dealing with the death of expectations, the death of worldviews, the death of dreams, the death of legacies, and the death of identity. We're all dealing with this. We can have compassion and generosity towards each other and support each other. All of us are dealing with this. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These are the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. We all go through those. None of us sidestep them. In fact, we often go through them again and again. But on the other side of acceptance, Paul Trafurka talks about finding the gift, finding the gift and local love and action. I prefer love and action to activism. It's whatever love motivates you to be in action around. And then I first learned from Guy McPherson, gallows humor is an, also a, an important stage in, uh, in grief. The Good Grief Network, 10 Steps 
to personal resilience and empowerment in a chaotic climate. I highly recommend the Good Grief Network. In fact, my interview, my conversation, my post-Doom conversation with Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rao, who are the co-founders of the Good Grief Network, I ask them to go through detail, you know, each step. I highly recommend their program and this post-Doom conversation with them. They're just amazing young women. So learn and feel together, learn about deep adaptation together and feel the stages of grief with others, nurture pro-future hopes and do so in community. Love and action. Relinquish human centeredness and honor the living world as thou, world as lover, world as self, world as father, world as mother. It doesn't matter. Any way to thinking about the biosphere that puts you in humility and helps you to live in a mutually enhancing relationship with primary reality. Grow in integrity. Integrity is right relationship to reality. And fall in love with a place or a species and then commit yourself to protecting, fostering, and defending that place or species. Many people don't understand the ecological and the evolutionary role of morality, the role of religion or life ways. We don't understand good and evil aren't arbitrary. It's, it's, not, it's not relative. Good and evil are about helping us to foster fidelity, that is right relationship to the past, right relationship to the future, and right relationship to the body of life upon which we depend. The role of morality is to foster fidelity, faithfulness, to the past, the future, and the body of life. Every culture has had to attend to ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Now, sustainable cultures do it in that order, ecological integrity first. Unsustainable cultures typically attend to social coherence and personal wholeness, but they kind of ignore ecological integrity. So good is what promotes or enhances or supports ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Evil is what diminishes or destroys ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. This is not moral rocket science. We don't need Ten Commandments to tell us this. And again, I go into this in great detail in my Sustainability 101, Indigenuity is Not Optional video. Teddy Goldsmith is the founder and the uh, major editor of The Ecologist magazine for almost 40 years. And this quote, he says, it's, a, it's an astonishing thought that we can completely destroy this planet, make it uninhabitable, and ensure the extinction of our species and countless others without violating a single law. So prophetic and redemptive love and action. It's not just immoral, it's evil to irreparably harm the future for short-term personal or institutional gain. Yet we have a global economic system supported by governments on every continent and accepted by adherents of every faith, ensuring that it's not only legal to betray posterity, it's profitable, highly profitable. So how do we live? What do we do? And how should we confront what is anti-future and thus evil? In other words, how do we protest and non-violently resist modern day structural, organizational, and institutional, that is legal evil, especially when we know that collapse is already underway and unstoppable? This is a fundamental question. Gandhi was all about confronting institutional evil. Martin Luther King Jr. was all about confronting institutional evil and injustice. And they didn't even know about collapse. So is it too late or is it not? Well, obviously it's too late for some things and it's not too late for others. It is too late to turn it around. It's too late to save Homo Colossus. That is where each of us uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste of Homo sapiens. It's too late to save Homo Colossus. Homo, Col Homo Colossus and his industrial humans is destined for extinction. That may or may not mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it certainly means the extinction of Homo Colossus. It's too late to win the blame game. It's too late to reverse global warming. It's too late to avoid reaping what we've sown. It's too late to prevent the sixth great mass extinction. It's too late to avoid a population bottleneck that is a die off due to overshoot. It's too late to prevent a blue ocean event, massive methane release, the conflagration of forests, the loss of coral reefs and so on. 
It's too late for a significant evolution of consciousness to transform the world. And it's too late to spare us from the consequences of millennia, not just centuries, but millennia of human-centeredness, anthropocentrism. But it's not too late for virtually everything that gives life meaning. It's not too late to invest in anything and everything having to do with ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Anything you do to further or enrich ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness, it's not too late for that, and it'll give your life deep meaning in doing it. It's not too late to limit our deadliest toxicity. It's not too late to assist trees in migrating. Turns out that the difference between hundreds or maybe thousands of species of native plants and trees going extinct this century and those same hundreds or thousands of species surviving the century depends on humans assisting them in migrating poleward. It's holy work. See, in the past, the costs of denial were local and usually transient. Today, the consequences will linger for millions of years. My wife, Connie Barlow, is one of the North America's leading voices in the field of assisted migration, assisting trees and migrating faster than any other animal can move them. In fact, there's a major book that it came out in June of 2020, The Journeys of Trees, a story about forests, people, and the future. It features my wife, Connie, from the very first sentence throughout the book. She's the main character of the book. So it's not too late to do that. It's not too late to be regenerative, not just to do regenerative things, to be regenerative in terms of how we are, who we be. Permaculture, agroecology, indigenuity, regenerative, everything having to do with regeneration. It's partnering with nature rather than competing with it, protecting the soil rather than disturbing it. It's promoting diversity rather than monoculture and it's holistic rather than reductionist. And these conversations, Denise Rushing, David Holmgren, Joe Brewer, Daniel Christian Wall, these are rock stars in the field of permaculture and regeneration. I highly recommend all of these conversations. This quote from Paul Hawken. There's a rabbinical teaching that says, if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. Building topsoil and planting trees while nurturing community is perhaps the most holy work that we can be engaged in. So it's not too late to be regenerative. It's not too late to be resilient. I love that. I, I, I got this quote just a few days ago from Chris Martinson. Plant a garden, meet your neighbors, practice generosity, learn new skills, control what you can, and leave the rest. What a wonderful short summary of what it is to be resilient. Less. I, I first learned this from John Michael Greer. He, he didn't have the, the second S. It's less with a lisp. Less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. I've added one more S to be committed to less suffering. We can all do this. Less energy, less stuff, less stimulation, and being committed to less suffering. And then complete your life and legacy, attending to what matters most. When I was diagnosed with cancer, a very aggressive form of cancer 10 years ago, I created a list of everybody I wanted to complete my life with because I realized I could die in the next eight months. Fortunately, the chemo worked, so I'm still alive. But I encourage you to not put off having conversations of gratitude, regret, and care. Expressing gratitude to the people who have been a contribution to your life, you will make their month if you just communicate to them out of the blue and just tell them how grateful you are for what a difference they made in your life, especially if they haven't heard from you in years or decades, you will blow them away. And expressing regret in 12-step work, this is called making amends, but it's just basically we've all left awake. We've all harmed people, betrayed people. We've had a negative impact. And for you to just actually make a list of the people that you've had a negative impact on and then reach out to them in a handwritten letter or a phone call or in person or whatever, it is so life-giving to us to express gratitude, to express regret, and then just care. I now have a list of all the people that I care about, and I'm reaching out to them, you know, one or two or three a week, just letting them know in this COVID area, hey, just want to check in, haven't talked to you in a long time, just want to let you know I, I care for you. I hope you're doing well. Expressions of gratitude, regret, and care attend to what matters most. So last section living life fully and loving the life you live, even at Tiatawaki. Expect breakdowns and unpleasant surprises. 
See, if you know that things that worked last month, last year, last decade aren't working now, and that's going to get worse in the future, if you expect that, then when unworkability shows up, breakdowns show up, unpleasant surprises, you're not going to be thrown off guard. You're going to realize, oh, right, right on schedule. So expect breakdowns and unpleasant surprises. Manage your meds or let Gaia, let God, let reality, let life, let your higher power do it, okay? I'm just talking about let the universe do it, you know? This is basic 12-step stuff, but manage your meds. In other words, we all have coping mechanisms that we've used over the decades to deal with reality. So manage that, and if you can't, let life do it. Renounce blaming and practice making life right. Making life right is a secular way of saying faith in God, trusting reality, trusting the universe, accepting what's so, just cherishing what is. Heal what you can and accept the rest. When I speak in religious audiences, I say redeem what you can and accept the rest. Be gentle and forgiving with yourself and others. It goes back to the, the second one there, which is, your body and your mind may want different things. Negotiate a truce between your body and mind or let life do it. Live and love as if this were your last year. This book, Stephen Levine, uh, A Year to Live, How to Live This Year as If It Were Your Last. You don't have to agree with his Buddhist metaphysics. You're going to find tremendous value in this book. Live this year as if it were your last. It will enrich your life hugely. Cultivate a habit of compassionate generosity. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a sort of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. I think everybody is deserving of compassion and generosity, but I think these six populations are especially deserving. Poor people, communities, and nations who will suffer the most from climate and ecological breakdowns, yet contributed the least to its causes. Those of us feeling the loneliness of having to navigate our own downshifting expectations, whilst family, friends, and maybe even spouses are in denial. Loved ones dying in COVID-19 isolation, and all beings who will suffer from the social, political, economic, and ecological collapse of industrial civilization. Techno-optimists and free market fundamentalists who will remain in denial the longest, yet be also hardest hit emotionally and financially when reality bites. Religious, political, and social liberals and progressives whose faith in the religion of perpetual progress is currently being shaken, shattered, or abandoned. And also deserving of compassion and generosity are religious conservatives and evangelicals whose faith in the Bible has blinded them to what reality God has evidentially revealed about our inner, outer, social, and mortal nature, and who thus struggle disproportionately with addiction, teen pregnancy, domestic violence, depression, suicide, and sin in general. And then finally, take 100% responsibility for your life. There's a chapter called Take 100% Responsibility for Your Life. That's the first chapter in Jack Canfield's book, The Success Principles. And I strongly encourage you to read, I mean, the whole book's good, but that chapter is life-changing. It changed my son's life. It changed many people's lives. And so stop here if you want and Google Jack Canfield, the Success Principles Library, or that URL right there, that PDF. You don't need to do everything. Do what calls your heart. Effective action comes from love. It is unstoppable and it is enough. So again, I'm now going to just take a couple minutes to talk about the post-Doom resources. Uh, this page here, resources, I've got actually 22 top-rated books uh, and 80 foundational articles and posts. I've recorded all of them. They're all freely available. 
these books, I'm not going to say more. I'll, I'll say more about these in the Q&A, but these are like the cream of the crop, the top of the top books related to collapse uh, and ecology. They're all available at postdoom.com resources, freely available. If you want the convenience of a flash drive, I've also put them on the flash drive. You can find them at postdoom.com slash flash drives. Also at that resources page, there's a collapse wiki, the best movies and documentaries from this post-doom perspective. And you can't get to post-doom without going through doom. So it's doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration with or without us. Nate Hagen's amazing Reality 101 videos and lots of YouTube educational programs and presentations. All of this is at thepostdoom.com slash resources. And here's my contact information, my YouTube channels, SoundCloud, and websites. Thank you for your time. <laughs>